Good evening to everybody present in the sanctuary and those of you watching online. It's my great pleasure to welcome Sir Anish Kapoor to our synagogue on the 25th anniversary of the inauguration of his Shoah Memorial. I've known Anish for 40 years and have admired his growth as an artist and as a person. He was born to a Jewish mother and a Hindu father in Mumbai in 1954. His maternal grandfather had been a cantor in the synagogue in Pune, and Anish and his brothers were brought up with a strong cultural awareness of their Judaism, which led him as a young man to live on Kibbutz Gan Shmuel in 1971. In Israel, he began to study electrical engineering, but soon found that his interest lay in art and maybe his talents. It is perhaps a blot on the record of the Bezalel Academy of Arts and Design in Jerusalem that they rejected his application to study fine art. But it was London's good fortune, as the rejection led him to apply to Hornsey College of Art and then Chelsea School of Art, where he came under the tutelage of the late Paul Neagu. British sculpture in the 20th century had a strong presence on the world stage beginning with Jacob Epstein, Henry Moore, and Barbara Hepworth. Their legacy was important for Anthony Caro, whose sister was a member of this synagogue, and his contemporaries to rebel against. And Caro's, in turn, was challenged by the generation of Barry Flanagan and Richard Long. The trajectory of British sculpture had been increasingly towards abstraction and conceptual art. But Anish and his generation began to think in more humanistic terms, how to bring the focus of sculpture back to the body and the lived experience. His early work stood out as distinctively different from other sculptural practices when he first showed them in the late 1970s and early 1980s. Using a palette of red, blue, and yellow pigments, redolent of those found outside Indian temples, he coated structures to create forms that evinced the Jungian archetypes of mountain, cave, void, and mother. At the same time, they made reference to the primary colors associated with the work of Mondrian, whose geometric abstraction had a spiritual quality associated with theosophy. A niche has always paid close attention to painting. The surfaces of these sculptures were fragile, affected by drafts and touch, and were surrounded by a penumbra of pigment suggesting growth out of the ground. I remember the excitement in the early 80s of seeing his first exhibitions at the Listen Gallery around the corner from the Liberal Jewish Synagogue, which led to the first of a number of acquisitions made by the Tate Gallery over the years. As his work developed, so the overtly symbolic characteristics receded the narrative quality, if you like, in favor of a deep engagement with the void, with the idea of an absent presence, of a disembodied corporeality. These were works which could be understood through the prism of phenomenology, either suspended as open cylinders on the wall or hewn out of stone but with dark blue or black pigmented interiors. The illusionism of these sculptures was disorientating, to comprehend them, the viewer had to project themselves into the infinite, to become disembodied, and yet to have a bodily experience. The number of people who furtively touched the sculptures so as to establish their physical presence, I mean both their presence before the sculpture and the presence of the sculpture itself before them, testifies to the power of Anisha's work. The first phase of his career climaxed when he was chosen to represent Britain at the Venice Biennale in 1990, where he was awarded the Premio Duemila for the best young artist. Shortly after that, he and I collaborated on a survey of his drawings at the Tate Gallery in the year he won the Turner Prize. International success increased the flow of works into public collections worldwide from Japan and New Zealand to the United States and Australia, Anisha's work was in demand, 
And with that success came scarcity of work and rising prices. So when I first proposed the niche as an artist to be commissioned by the LJS for the Shur Memorial, it was with some doubt that we could afford it. I'd been brought onto the committee after it had met for about a year without being able to find the right artist. I suggested two artists, the other shall remain nameless, but he is now equally well known. And there was also a proposal to make a memorial incorporating Czech scrolls designed by Les Kosky, architect of the synagogue. We invited the three of them to submit proposals, all of which were compelling, but Anish won the day. David Goldberg and I were adamant that this would be the right choice and gradually we won the backing of the committee. There was, of course, a question of cost. The amount of money available really was insufficient, but Anish was generous. He asked merely for the cost of materials and installation and no more. And I remember him telling me, it's about time I made some kind of Holocaust memorial. So, what was it that prompted me to propose a niche to David Goldberg and the committee? It was the sense of transcendence evinced by Anisha's work, the idea that the sculpture was more than the object before us, taking the viewer beyond physical presence into a reflective space, into a state of suspension, neither in the world nor out of it. Through the power of color and surface, Anish creates a space beyond the here and now, a dark world, what the Jewish philosopher Emmanuel Levinas called a descent of the night, an invasion of shadow. It's not a revelatory space, but an empty space, a void, that seems so appropriate when recalling the horror of the Shoah, a space of the unknown that has its origin in doubt and not knowing but one with the potential of becoming. It is uncanny, unheimlich is Freud's word, womb-like, familiar and unfamiliar, what Plato described as the cora, both receptacle and nurse. And finally, Anisha's unwillingness to ascribe specific meaning to a work, but to allow poetic meaning to accrue or as he puts it, to bring things to expression rather than to express, made his work particularly suitable to the difficult task of creating a Shoah memorial. The sculpture is carved from three tons of Kilkenny limestone. It lies on the central axis of the building, opposite the Ark and the Jerusalem stone in the sanctuary, linking the inner sanctum to the outside. In its hollowed out shape, it even recalls the Ark. The polished interior reflects light, creating an equivalent of the Ne'er Tamid. It provides a calm place for the repository of thoughts, a makom, an in-between space, a concept Anish frequently used to refer to when talking to me about his early work. There are many other Holocaust memorials, but none more intimate than this. What's so special about this work is it obliges the viewer to be fully aware of their own presence before it, but also to lose themselves. The only equivalent I can think of in 20th century art is sitting in the Rothko room in the Tate or standing before a large painting by Barnett Newman. Other Holocaust memorials, for example, Sol Lewitt's large black wall or Rachel Whitebread's library in Vienna, eloquent as they are, rebuff the viewer. Anisha's memorial draws them in. Since its creation, Anisha's gone on to have an increasingly distinguished career. He was the first living British artist to be given a major exhibition at the Royal Academy. He has created a number of enormous installations, not least the magnificent Marcius at Tate Modern, in the Turbine Hall. He has created the large cloud gate in Millennium Park, Chicago, and the orbit sculpture at the Olympic site in London. He's held exhibitions all over the world, and next year he'll be only the second living artist to be invited to mount an exhibition at the Academia in Venice. 
He was awarded a CBE in 2003, knighted in 2013, and he's been a trustee of the Tate Gallery. Not in my time, I hasten to add. <clears throat> this is not the moment to talk about all the many changes that his work has undergone since making the sculpture here. It's sufficient to say that he's continued to explore themes related to the body and the spirit. But Anish is more than just an artist. He is a campaigner, a strong believer in human rights and justice. He stood up for Ai Weiwei when he was under house arrest in China. He has defended the art schools in this country against constant government impoverishment. He stood up against the vilification of Muslims. He's publicly condemned state violence against democratic protest in Thailand. And in 2017, on winning the Genesis Prize, the so-called Jewish Nobel Prize, he pledged his winnings to support Syrian refugees. He does not take his fame lightly, but uses it to support good causes. And now in Oxford, he has an exhibition of paintings and sculptures that while in some regard provide reflections on the body and the écorché, made me think a lot about global warming. The paintings on view there are impressions of a different kind of Holocaust, of the earth engulfed in flames, volcanic explosions, and charred, disintegrating bodies. It is powerful testimony to the dangerous times in which we live and which our politicians seem so incapable of confronting. And now that seems like a good moment to call Anish to the lectern to deliver his talk. Thank you, dear Jeremy. We are old friends, and that means a lot to me. Um, I'm going to start by saying what Jeremy's already said about me. I'm a Sephardic Jew, my father was Indian, and my mother was a Baghdadi Jew whose family fled Baghdad in the 1920s and settled in Bombay. Even though my grandfather was the cantor at the synagogue in Pune, we were not religious Jews. We were brought up conscious of our Jewishness, conscious of our Jewish inheritance, but ours was a Jewishness of community and identity. What a wait to be here this evening on the anniversary of Kristallnacht to talk about conceptualizing and expressing the un unimaginable. Thank you, Rabbi. An appropriate question, of course, for this moment of horrific recall. How can we, in our lives of privilege, imagine the horror of such events? And yet, today, Somewhere in the world, equivalent horrors are taking place. We human beings hold within us deep beauty and deep violence. Beauty is around us at every moment, and yet somehow we too often fail to see it or cannot allow ourselves to see it. Violence is with us as a constant. Violence, I'm going to say, is the inarticulate, unspoken, or unrecognized known. Violence sits within us, waiting to pounce. It readily finds voice in collective, as we know, in collective acts of horror, political and communal. And yet, I'm going to say, violence is deeply generative. It has a pivotal role to play in the formation of art. Forgive me for being naughty here, but I do feel it is a vital question. Violence and its articulations or disavowals 
led on one hand to Mahatma Gandhi's non-violence, non-violent actions, and on the other hand, the nasty neo-nationalism of our current era with its echoes of 70 years ago. It is my conviction that violence has also led artists to make their finest work. Jackson Pollock, Pablo Picasso, amongst many, many, many others. I am saying, therefore, that beauty and violence are inextricably linked. In scripture, in art, in literature, we find ample evidence that beauty and violence are in a psychic continuum. Jeremy went, mentioned a wonderful word, which I'm going to go to next. In Hebrew, there's a, there's, a, there's a concept. It starts, like many things in Jewish theology, with a word. The word, of course, is makom. Makom, literally translated, means place. Place, here, now. But makom place is also the site of Abraham's sacrifice, the place at the center, the sacred mound, the site of the first temple of Jerusalem, by extension, the site, the naming of the omnipresent. It is, of course, a word for God. Let's think about this for a minute. Makom, meaning here, now, physical, particular, is also the name for the ineffable, the distant, the far away, the, the everywhere, the unreachable, the intangible. What a wonderful dichotomy. I must say, I love this. Um, in other words, the present is not present. The physical is not only physical. The sight, as in place, is speaking of sight, as in the act of seeing with our eye or inner eye. This is precisely, may I say, what art does. A bit like beauty and violence. Like this, with each other. Art is able to enmesh the here and now with the not here and the not now. Macomb points at the poetics of the object, the imaging of the unimageable, that, I'm saying, without image, that which is outside of image, and therefore, or through this, perhaps, the Jewish disavowal of the image. Mythological projections that emerge, therefore, out of the physical object, the physical thing, here and now, turned into here and there. All objects have this ontological reality, or is it, perhaps, that we, our eyes, are incapable of looking without projection? I mean, of course, the projection of love, the projection of hate, the projection of want, or the projection of or desire, or the projection of abjection, etc., etc. Art, then, I say, has a double being. It is present here in a physical, as a physical phenomena, but its deep purpose is mythological, tied up in, in otherness, as if in fiction, in the unknown and the unknowable. The fiction of art is therefore arguably, I say, more real than the apparently real. Does this, do these ponderings bring us any closer to conceptualizing or expressing the unimaginable? Another way to think about this double reality may be this. This body, this body of mine, this physical thing that I am, my body, your body, seemingly describes me and you. And yet, when I close my eyes, the space I occupy is vastly bigger, unknowably deeper, 
profoundly more than this physical thing can, this, can hold. Is it, could it be, that the inside is bigger than the container? Clearly it can be. Once again, Macomb has indescribable otherness, place turned into space. In this place right here, not just because it's a synagogue, but in this place right here, symbolically, Macomb, the inconceivable, is all around us. And of course, I'm not necessarily just talking about God. So what then does an artist do? What do I do to conceive of the inconceivable? I don't wake up in the morning and decide today I'm going to make something of the inconceivable. Of course, that's ridiculous. Um, all I can do is to continue my practice and cultivate the means by which I might tumble into something I don't know or haven't done before. I'm a believer in the wonderful Zen saying, which says, first idea, best idea. In other words, unpreparedness is my only, only recourse. It is my duty to my practice to de-educate myself, to de-school myself, and in so doing, to reach beyond what I know. Of course, I can't do this as an act of will, but rather from deep, continuing repetition and re-articulation from deep practice. In Freud's great insight of psychoanalysis, we see that continual repetition eventually articulates a previously unconscious psychic reality. Fear, sexuality, trauma, and perhaps the semi-conscious known. And sometimes, as if in revelation, the completely unknown. I describe this almost, I think, like an act of prayer, an incant incantation calling on the unknown. I think of the religious Jew rocking backwards and forwards, talking to God, reaching deep and deeper and deeper into herself, attempting transformation. I once had a conversation with a quantum physicist and asked him in jest, seriously in jest, um, if at a quantum level there was a difference between the oil paint in the tube of paint and the oil paint on a great work of art. Once it had, un and this great work of art, of course, taken as given, had, had undergone the transformation that made it into art. So the material had physically undergone a something. Of course, he couldn't answer me, not surprisingly. But I know that since alch alchemical, alchemical transformation has taken place in the work of art, material difference is real. At a quantum, i.e. physical level, and of course, at poetico-mythological levels. So I think this is desperately serious um, here. The, unimage, the unimaginable happens, but again, not as an act of will. Psychic matter mixes with physical matter in some mysterious act of transformation or transmutation. I have circled the topic I was asked to speak about and have suggested that the unimaginable is held deep in ourselves as the unconscious known. And I put those two words together because that's what I mean, the unconscious known. That which I know, but don't know I know. Macomb is the present 
unknown, the physically present unknown, linked to, in my view, the subconscious known. So full of contradictory propositions, this way and that. As if knowing and unknowing are present in each other. Art, in its way, nominates a site or a makom for itself, and only in so doing can it speak of what speak both of what is present and what is not present or what is absent. I want to end by saying a few words about Rabbi Goldberg and Jeremy. When we were thinking about the, the, the Holocaust Memorial here in this synagogue, Rabbi Goldberg came to my studio with Jeremy and we discussed how not, to, how not representing the facts of the Shoah might be, might be a way of conceiving a memorial. There are lots of memorials in the world that represent or attempt to represent beyond me. How can you? How can we? Anyway, memorializing, I have always felt, is done by you, you, the audience, in witness to something that gives space to the inconceivable or the mysterious. If it is that the artist is a mediumistic being, then it is that you, the viewer, are the artist's accomplice and, and complete the circle of the work. And I think that's terribly important. Rabbi Goldberg was my collaborator, I must say, in this way of thinking. I admire him for the fact that he had a great belief in the dialogue between the spiritual and the political. I admire that he spoke of the Bangladeshi immigrants, immigrant community in the East End of London as following in the footsteps of the Jews who were once there and have to this day to endure the racist attitudes that were sadly the lot of our community in the East End. In this time, may I please say, when global capitalism has taken over every desire, our every aspiration, our every utopian or egalitarian possibility, I believe we have somehow once again to in interrogate the link between beauty and violence, between present and imagined. Rabbi Hillel, you know, the great rabbi, contemporary of Jesus, asked three questions, to which I have added a fourth question by the great poetess Adrian Rich, who you should read if you haven't. They give reflection. If I am not for myself, who will be there for me? If I am only for myself, what am I? If not now, when? And then, if not with others, how? Thank you. Thank you, Anish, for a really interesting and thoughtful talk. Um, so many ideas in it, and um, it's hard to know where to begin, but I think I'd like to begin with this idea of um, making a work without knowing where you're going, launching into the unknown, because obviously when you're carving a sculpture like the Shoah Memorial or any others, you obviously have an idea to start with, and it's an expensive material, and you can't just throw it away, but we may not necessarily know exactly how it's going to turn out, and I think that might have been the case with this. So could you just talk a little bit about how this came about? Right. 
Yes, okay. So um, I was in my studio. I'm going to start before uh, uh, the events you mentioned. But I was in my studio, and I spent um, years making objects, pigment and all that stuff. And then one day I was oh, exhausted, and, uh, and I, I made myself a great big bowl. You know, it's that big. Um, I hollowed it out without really knowing what I was doing. I was working in polystyrene, and then I covered it in, in resin, and don't ask me, I'd never worked with the color blue, so I, I painted it a very, very dark blue, rather like your suit, dear sir, um, um, and put it on the wall. Again, not the thing you would do with a bowl, anyway. It suddenly filled up with darkness. It wasn't just a blue bowl. It was a space full of darkness. I have no idea where it came from. Working with that over, the, over a number of years, I then had the thought, wondered to myself, what would happen if that hollow negative space was mirrored? In other words, was a space full of mirror. Now, the tradition in sculpture, of course, is that mirror has been used for very centuries, but always on convex forms, hardly ever on concave forms, only in science on concave forms. Um, anyway, and suddenly, this was a space then filled up with mirror. And it was a slow extension from that to think of um, a hollow stone with a mirrored interior. And what surprised me about it is that it made this ghost image of the column. I, I didn't know that was going to happen. Um, so, so um, and that felt to me as if it might have something to do with um, the recall of what we are here to, to, to commemorate and discuss this evening. So <clears throat> the actual conception of this particular sculpture, um, in a sense, was accidental. It, was, it came out of an experiment, as you were saying earlier on, constantly pushing a boundary. Absolutely, <clears throat> absolutely. Um, I mean, you know, of course, Knowing and not knowing is what I think you're trying to ask me about. And um, um, how do I, you know, what a strange idea, de-educate myself. What the hell does that mean? What can that mean? Um, and yet I, I do firmly believe that daily practice, daily practice, um, go into the studio, don't, I don't, I try to, I try not to, um, you know, have a, some wonderful idea. I can't have an idea. No ideas. Just go in and work. And watch the process. Watch it and watch it and watch it. Um, and reflect on what occurs and, and, and where it might lead. Um, um, sculpture's a notoriously slow process, but there are all kinds of ways around it, if you know what I mean. So I think the idea of repeating um, mm and unlearning actually is um, fundamental to modernism. Mm. Um, artists in the 20th century have all, in a sense, de-skilled themselves, mm. whether it was Barnett Newman painting a mm. relatively blank looking canvas or, or mm. any of those. Uh, and it was, in a sense, a search for authenticity, mm. for some kind of authenticity uh, in modernist terms. Um, I think that, um, with uh, your art, it, it's not quite that quest, if you um, like. Um, <coughs> you know, I, I've been in psychoanalysis. No, I'm not, I still am anyway, whatever, whatever, for 25 years or longer, 35 years, too many years. Um, um, and I've learned from it that it is an iterative process in which the same thing again and again. Oh God, I'm bored with myself. You know, again and again and again and again. But lurking in there, um, there are 
these moments or these these reoccurring realities that that are utterly surprising. Um, so I take that method to the studio. What I'm interested in is not um, um, for itself making something new. No, I'm interested in that psychic matter, if you like. Um, well, in Freudian terms... That I might struggle with, or whatever it is. Yeah. In Freudian terms, repetition is a way of working through trauma as of well. Of course it is. And loss. Of course and, it is. And that, it seems to me, is very is. pertinent to, of course. to this of course it is. Of course memorial. It is. Of course it is. And the idea of beauty and violence, I think, is also the... the um, they're like Gemini. They're, they're twins. Mm. Um, and, of course, carving into a stone is a violent act. Uh, it's quite an interesting concept, I think. And there's a lot of violence in your art as well as serenity. Um, there are two different sides to the coin, though. I mean, the, some of your art is overtly violent. I mean, it feels like some of these things in Oxford right now seem to me to express a violence, which is relatively new to your art. It started with earlier paintings. Mm. Um, less so with the sculptures. Perhaps. Well, I mean, many years ago, I showed a work at the Royal Academy called Shooting Into the Corner, mm. um, which is a canon, um, shooting into the corner, literally. Um, um, extremely aggressive, extremely violent. Of course, um, um, I was interested or you know, the artist is a kind of idiot-savant in some way or the other. I, I had this idea about uh, making shooting into the corner like that. And I decided, like that also, to do it, to actually do it and not just sit with it. Um, and then realized, <clears throat> with, as it is with all these things, um, or many of these things, or some of these things, that there was a whole thing going on. The corner, the corner, of course, is a fundament of 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 architecture. It's, if you might, you, one might say, a primal element of culture. Um, shooting, of course, is deeply aggressive, phallic. Um, the caller might be talked of as female. So there was very quickly a kind of um, um, psychosexual thingy going on. Um, then. Um, of course, from Goya to Jackson Pollock, the whole idea of um, um, the victim, the, sp the, 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 the splashing of paint, I chose, of course, as I always do, to use um, deep, dark red. Um, and it suddenly felt as if what started as an idiotic idea had all this gravitas like this. Um, and I've taken it seriously, and it's led in its way, perhaps, to this group of, this group of paintings um, that are now, that I'm working on, that are now in Oxford and so on. Unfortunately, we've run out of our time, but it's been a fascinating uh, conversation and talk. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.